Welcome to the highlights of this week's Politics Hub programme. Events in the Middle East continue to overshadow domestic politics. Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer continue to express support for Israel's right to defend itself. But that position is coming under pressure as Israeli preparations for a ground invasion ramp up and the dire humanitarian crisis unfolds in Gaza. And the issue is especially divisive for Labour, with a growing rift in the ranks over the leadership refusing to call for a ceasefire. And it was that, the question of a ceasefire or a humanitarian pause, that dominated the political debate this week. On Wednesday, I spoke to the Defence Secretary Grant Chaps and began by asking, what was the difference between the two? The difference is, you know, we understand that Israel was attacked in a very brutal way by Hamas terrorists, butchering men, women and children, cutting heads off uh, ISIS style. Uh, and I think it's, um, uh, I think, you know, to, to then ask Israel not to respond, in other words, uh, what you describe as a ceasefire, uh, I think is, is untenable. They have a perfect right to go after uh, those terrorists, but it's the international humanitarian situation uh, that a pause could really assist with. So effectively, it's it's got a time limit on it, and is it localised in a specific area? Is that is that the difference? Well, specifically, what we need to do is make sure that we can get aid, and it's not just that single flight with 21 tonnes of aid for Gaza that uh, that we've sent in today, but 30 million pounds uh, of uh, aid announced so far, so that's a lot more. Um, and of course, it's very important that it can, for example, cross in through the Rafa uh, crossing uh, between Egypt uh, and Gaza, uh, and um, important that humanitarian work can go on to get that aid to to, to people on the ground. Um, so, you know, yes, it's important to do that, but to, to call for a ceasefire is to essentially say, to Israel, having gone through that absolutely horrific, horrendous uh, terrorist attack uh, just two and a half weeks ago, uh, the, you know, don't go after Hamas. And I don't think anyone thinks that would be right uh, because they have the perfect right to go after uh, Hamas uh, under international law. Now, you're in Saudi Arabia. Um, ahead of your visit, you tweeted to say, we're engaging with over 40 nations to deter a devastating escalation in the Middle East. And then you reiterated that, that you're working with partners who share our desire to de-escalate. You're also saying, of course, Israel has the right to defend itself. You've said that again in the interview. So I'm just trying to get my head around what the government position actually is. Because you're saying you want de-escalation, but you're also saying that Israel has a right to defend itself. So, so what does that mean, has a right to defend itself? Yeah, I mean, very, very simply, um, you know, if you, this were the other way around, if, if there had been a huge terrorist attack on, on the scale in the United Kingdom, uh, unfortunately, we've never seen anything on that scale, um, no one would seriously expect us not to go after the perpetrators. Uh, and so we understand and appreciate under international law that Israel has the absolute right to do that. We also believe that it needs to be done uh, in a proportionate way with international uh, human uh, uh, rights law in, in place, and that's that's very I'm clear. Gonna, when I talk I'm just going to jump in, if I can, because, you know, you, you know what, you say it has to be done in a proportionate way, so I'm just trying to look at some specifics because I'm kind of hearing all these phrases and to be completely honest with you, I'm not really sure what they mean in practical terms. So would a ground invasion, as the Prime Minister of Israel is talking about today, would a ground invasion fall under Israel's right to defend itself? Well, as long as the people that they are going after are Hamas terrorists, yes. Um, you know, the, the problem we have with Hamas, of course, uh, it's not just that they butchered and killed and raped uh, those Israelis, it's that they also use their own Palestinian population, uh, who have no friends of, of Hamas, uh, as human shields, and they hide themselves uh, amongst them. Uh, and so we understand and appreciate that it's a very difficult position for Israel to be in. But nonetheless, I, when I speak... How about cutting Sorry, off fuel? Ahead. How about cutting off fuel to Gaza, which could be used by Hamas. Israel worries about it being used by Hamas. Would that fall under Israel's right to defend itself? Well, and, and this is the problem, of course, that Hamas will stop at nothing to use resources to, to steal the aid as well and use it. But that is why 
the United Kingdom uh, works both publicly and behind the scenes. So I say the same thing when I speak to my opposite number, the Israeli Defence Minister Gallant. I say it to him as well. It's very important to respect international humanitarian law. And that does mean uh, making sure that things like food and water, power, uh, can, can get through as well as the aid that we're sending. What's the answer to the question? Because it, because it is a really live debate. You know, the UN are saying they're going to run out of fuel within hours, which they need for their aid trucks to run. Rishi Sunak has talked at PMQs about saying Gaza is in need of water, fuel, fuel, food and fuel. But Israel won't let fuel in because they effectively say it's been used by Hamas. So who's right? Does cutting off fuel to Gaza fall under Israel's right to defend itself? Well, and which is exactly why we talk about uh, being able to get our, our own aid in uh, and to deliver it in a, a manner where we know that it goes to the people of Gaza, the Palestinians, not to Hamas, who are using them for cover. So, uh, you know, it's this is not, I'm afraid, a, a really clear-cut picture where, you know, it, it, you know, had Hamas not started this, had Hamas not uh, gone and butchered. Uh, people and that terrorist, horrendous terrorist attack. We wouldn't be in this position. We are, and the answers are not completely clear cut. Because if you were to say Israel should do nothing, then you're essentially saying that those terrorists should just get away with it. And of course, no one in their right mind would think that this is true either. The UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has said that the attacks by Hamas did not happen in a vacuum. The Palestinian people have been subjected to 56 years of suffocating occupation. Now, the Israelis are very angry at his comments. They've called for his resignation. Should he go now that he's lost their confidence? I think his words were very surprising for a Secretary General. I thought they were uh, poorly um, set out. There can be no circumstances in which there is an attempt to justify the sort of butchery, ISIS-style beheadings uh, that Hamas um, performed uh, just two and a half weeks ago. So I think it is surprising language from a Secretary General. Uh, I, I, I am very open to, and we are uh, him uh, correcting the record. I see he's gone some way to try to uh, do that. I think words do matter in a situation like this. Uh, and, uh, and, and it is never appropriate to attempt to justify that action, uh, because uh, in what world uh, would you ever need to cut people's heads off? Are you comfortable with him staying in his job? Well, look, that's a matter for the UN. We're not calling for him to go. We are calling for him to uh, clarify uh, his comments, and he has some work to do, I think, uh, in, in that regard. On Tuesday, the government announced plans to move thousands of Channel migrants out of hotels. 50 hotels will close to migrants by January and a further 50 after that. Immigration Minister Robert Jenrick told MPs that hotels should be used for hosting events we treasure, like weddings and birthdays, instead of housing illegal migrants. So on Tuesday's programme, we spoke to one MP who said in his area they've taken back control. Conservative MP for Ipswich is here with us now. Thank you very much for being with us. So, hotel closing to mm. asylum seekers in your constituency, you welcome mm. that? Very much so. I mean, I've, I've campaigned as hard as I can to get to get to, to this point, um, and I've, I had a Westminster Hall debate about it, um, explaining some of the negative impacts it's had on the town. So, I'm very pleased. Um, I have to talk to you about this quote you gave to The Sun. We've taken back control of the Novotel. I mean, is that going to be your next election well, slogan? We're taking back well, control well, well, of the Novotel? I wouldn't say that, but actually, I think the Minister dealt with this quite well today. And he, well, you did and, say and that. That was your quote, wasn't it? I, 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 absolutely. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> disowning it at all, no. But I think the Minister dealt with it um, quite well when he was explaining about the importance of hotels. And this, yes, obviously, there are places people go and stay if they're visiting the area, but often hotels are used for wedding ceremonies, community events, and certainly the Novotel Hotel in Ipswich Walls. So it is going to be delivering community benefits for the economy uh, and for the wider community. So I think it, you know, it is taking back control. Um, how big an issue is this on the doorstep for you in Ipswich? Um, I, think, I think immigration, um, particularly for those who voted Conservative in 2019, I, I think is arguably the number one issue. Uh, and I think it's, you know, and, and we really need to deliver on both illegal migration, but actually legal migration, which I think most people in the country think is far too high, also needs to be brought under control as well. I just want to talk to you about something that you uh, said recently at a Conservative conference. Mm. You said it was not xenophobic to not want to feel like you're living in a foreign country. Mm. And I just wondered, what, what do you mean like that? What, what do you mean feeling like you're yeah. living in a foreign country? Well, well I, think it's, I think it's, you know, um, I think if you walk into your town centre, and I think if you're, you know, you're hearing 
almost people speaking English is almost a rarity. You're hearing... That's not what people find, is there? Come on. Well, I think lots of people do find that. Lots 88% of people, of people lots in Ipswich have English as the main of, language. Lots of, people, lots of people, when they walk into their um, town centres and city centres across the country, often feel that way. Uh, and I do think there's examples where we've had a lack of integration. I think when you don't get integration, I think this can become a problem. When you get integration, diversity is a force for good. It's brilliant. It adds vibrancy to communities. When you don't get integration, when people don't integrate, that's when you get the problems. And if you have people in your town centre, your city centre, who, who aren't making the effort to uh, integrate, who are behaving in a way that, it, that isn't in keeping with what people would expect in well, that what area... You, what, what would that be, then, to behave in a way that wasn't well, in keeping well, with what so for example, so not speaking English? Well, but that's, that's one element to it. Another element to it, for example, is we've got, you know, in the town that I represent, we've got shop theft on the rise. And there is one community that is disproportionately behind the shop theft. You know, and I've been to 12... Uh, only a few months ago, I went to 12 different shops in the town centre with the police superintendent. They all said exactly the same thing. And these are people whose politics were all over the spectrum. Do you have the data to back that up, or is yeah. that just what you've been told in, uh, in uh, shops? What I mean, no, it, it's, it's something which is, you know, nobody, no, nobody disputes that locally. Nobody disputes that locally. But has there been, has there been analysis done of...? of... But there, but there is analysis done. There's, there's, I mean, there's lots of... Who buy? Do you, do you um, have it? But, but with the police have the data. And I, and, and I think, you know... but. Every single shop we went to said that, and I and, and I think that I think it, it is we, we've got to be open about that. It's a challenge, and I, I I think we've got to work with the, the, the community in question to try and deal with that problem. Um, but I think it's com when you get integration, diversity is a force for good. Immigration is a force for good. When you don't get integration, it's a big problem. And I think actually that view that I've expressed is actually a mainstream view shared by a majority of people in the country. Not everyone. I'm not saying everyone, but actually I think you'll find there's a silent majority who would actually agree with that view. And I've had since I made the comments I made at conference, I've had over 200 emails from constituents, and 90% of them have been positive. Okay. Thank you very much. Interesting to talk to you. Still to come, we speak to the shadow health secretary, West Streeting. Well, a little earlier, I spoke to the Shadow Health Secretary, Wes Struting. I began by asking if there should be a ceasefire in Gaza. I don't think anyone wants to see this conflict. Uh, it was started by Hamas when they crossed over into Israel, unleashed unspeakable barbaric acts against innocent civilians and took hostages, including British citizens, who are still being held captive. In that circumstance, Israel has not just a right to defend itself, but a duty to protect its citizens. And Israel and other countries, including ours, have a responsibility to get our people back. But one of the responsibilities I think we bear as an international community is to recognise the humanitarian catastrophe that's unfolding in Gaza, a responsibility to minimise loss of civilian life, those innocent civilians in, in Gaza lying in the darkness, wondering if the world is even noticing what they are going through, we have a responsibility to get um, aid and humanitarian support in. And that's why I think uh, Secretary Blinken, our allies in France, our government and the Labour Party are right to urge a humanitarian pause to allow the safe flow of aid through. What's the difference between a humanitarian pause and a ceasefire? Well, you know, I think it's hard to... And this is the difficulty with, with, with the concept of, of, of ceasefire. We're dealing with a terrorist organisation in Hamas, which continues to... But, but what's the difference uh, between a humanitarian pause and a ceasefire? Well, it, look, it is simply allowing humanitarian aid in uh, without the risk of, of bombardment, without the risk of military fire. I, I, that's what we're asking our so ally it's, it's in... Just in a localised area. Well, that's, and that's, no what, that's, what, that's what we're asking... That's what we're asking, um, you know, the players involved in this conflict to abide by. It seems a bit, of a, a bit different, if I'm being completely honest, with what Keir Starmer said in the kind of immediate aftermath of the terror attack that we saw from Hamas. And I just want to quote in full the LBC interview that he gave, because there has been, as you know, a big reaction to this interview, including from many in the Labour Muslim community. So I just want to get it completely clear what he said in that interview. So Nick Ferrari, the presenter asked what a proportionate response to the attacks would look like. Keir Starmer said the responsibility lies with Hamas and Israel has the right to defend itself. Nick Ferrari then says a siege is appropriate, cutting off power, cutting off water. And Keir Starmer said, I think that Israel does have that right. It is an ongoing situation. So does Keir Starmer still think that cutting off power and water 
is appropriate and that Israel has that right, or has he changed his mind? No, and and look, um, no, I, I, no, he, he doesn't. He think doesn't it's think right. it's okay to, to, to cut off power and water. So and he actually, think he's changed the, his mind. No, no, uh, and I think the next sentence beyond, uh, I think he once again returned to. Israel has a right to defend itself. Look, in, in, in defence of Keir, firstly, he's acknowledged that people have interpreted his words as justifying um, those tactics, which that was not his intention at all. I've been in interviews with you and your colleagues before where you have a sustained line of questioning. There are lots of things that are worrying through your mind. You, you want to make sure you, you get it right. I think Keir was ask, ask, answering a previous question, not that direct question, so in, he, in, all, in all honesty. So but, you think you know, he, he Labour's, missed, Labour's he, position has continuously been Israel has a right to defend itself within human, you know, in, international so do law. You think, do you think and that, those laws are particularly you, important. I just, I just, want, to, I just want to come in. Cause it, uh, are you saying that Keir Starmer misspoke in that interview? Yeah, I think Keir, Keir's clarified what he meant. He's understood did, and did, acknowledged. Well, to be fair to, be fair to Keir, he has understood and acknowledged that people misinterpreted what what he meant. Um, and I'm just going back to and, what, and what as he a result, said, the people have been power, you know, hurt and offended. Water, and he's clarified. I that. think that Israel does have that right. So, and look, I, I totally get what you're saying about you know interviews and, and etc. And I don't really think it's a bad thing if people do change their minds once they see more evidence and once they hear other views as well. So are you saying that Keir Starmer effectively misspoke in that interview? Yeah, look, it's, it was, or that it was, he's changed it was, his it was mind never, it, it was never Keir's intention to give the impression that we support um, those measures. He's been very clear throughout, as has David Lammy, our Shadow Foreign Secretary, Lisa Nandy, our Shadow International Development Minister, clear throughout... Israel does have a right to defend itself. What does that mean? But it's got to... It's, well, because in, in, in any conflict situation... A ground invasion, would in, that be in, the in right any, to, well, in, to... any, in any conflict situation, and especially at, um, at a moment where Israel has been on the receiving end of something which is extraordinarily unique and, and, and evil in, in the context of Israel's history, I think it's the, the worst act of terrorism uh, that they have experienced. Um, we, we've seen the unspeakable acts that were committed against innocent Israelis and the hostages that have been taken, it is at those moments when international law, the rules that we've collectively signed up to and agreed to, become even more important. Keir Starmer's been meeting with some Labour supporters from the Muslim uh, community who, frankly, are quite angry about Labour's initial response to this. I mean, you must have been contacted by people in your constituency about this? Yeah, Keir acknowledged that in terms of that LBC clip you mentioned, that there were people who, who watched it, thought he was justifying those actions or supporting them, and were hurt by it, and Keir's acknowledged that, and he's clarified what he meant. We're straight in there. Now, Ali Malani from the Labour Muslim Network, former Labour Party candidate who actually stood against Boris Johnson in his Uxbridge seat in the 29 election, is here now. Thank you for being with us. Now, there's been a letter uh, from 150 Muslim Labour councillors um, to the leadership over its response to the situation. You organised the letter. W why did you do that? Well, the Labour Muslim Network supported the letter, but the letter was brought about independently and organically from Muslim councillors. And I think the reason behind that is there's a huge strength of feeling. I think the, the pain, the outrage, some of the anger in the communities, in the Muslim communities towards Labour, following comments, not just made by Keir, but by various uh, members of the leadership, has caused huge amounts of offence and pain. And what we wanted to do was begin to rebuild that trust between the Muslim community uh, and the Labour Party. And the way to do that is, you know, we, we've talked about the comments that are being made. I think it's very, very clear how offensive and hurt people have been. But the position now and the call now from what's now 250 Muslim councillors is an immediate ceasefire, is the position that we should be taking. Enough bloodshed. Do you think that some Muslim councillors, some you know, Muslim voters who support Labour, this is something that will make them stop voting Labour again? I, th I think the anger is very, very high. I have to say the last 12 days or so, um, I think since the LBC interview, have been the hardest days of me being a Labour Party member and a Labour Party activist. The Muslim community has been, historically, one of the most loyal voter ba bases for Labour anywhere. A Salvation poll that we did showed 76% of, of registered Muslim voters support Labour. That's one of the largest groups of votes right. and, and communities that supports Labour. Don't throw it away. This, uh, they're now calling for a very clear position. And it's one that the British public supports. The majority of British public, according to a YouGov poll, support a, uh, an immediate ceasefire. I need to talk to you about some <coughs> tweets that you sent previously mm -hmm. that have been put in the public domain when you were running around, I think, the time when you were running uh, to be a candidate. 
you said that it happened when you were a teenager, so it was around the kind of 2013 mark. So you tweeted in February 2013, Israel has no right to exist. Mm -hmm. uh, you also tweeted to a friend saying, no, you won't, mate, it'll cost you a pound, hashtag Jew. I mean, what would you say to that? I mean, I'm deeply embarrassed by that. In fact, I have spoken about this mm -hmm. at length. I think we spoke about it yeah, previously. Have, yeah. In a coffee shop outside mm -hmm. Uxbridge and South Ryslip and said, you know, th these were deep, deep mistakes that I made. As, as, as a teenager and don't represent who I am now. I've, I've been immensely privileged, actually. I, one of, when I reached out to Jewish communities mm -hmm. and Jewish organizations as a student, I was able to go with the Holocaust Memorial Trust to Auschwitz so I understand how deep that is. And, do and do I you guess... think if some people hear those tweets or, or see you, you mm -hmm. know, uh, knowing that you sent them, that it will fuel, I guess, fears in some communities that the position comes from a place of anti-Semitism? Uh, look, I'm sure it, it would worry anyone, as it would if it was Islamophobia for me, something I care deeply about. I guess what I would say is I've been very open about them. Uh, and I, even in a, a book I wrote, I dedicated an entire chapter to talk about how I think others can avoid falling into the traps um, that I've fallen. And I guess it goes to Keir's comments as well. This is where I understand. The following day, I, I, I followed... Um, here on LBC, and I said, maybe he's misspoken, maybe he's made a mistake. I know better than anyone what it's like to make a mistake um, in the public domain, but the right position is, is to fix it, um, is to clarify it, is to make amends and make steps towards, um, towards rebuilding that trust. And that's something I continuously do and hope to, to continuously do, and that's something that I call on all politicians to do, is to take the right, right moral position. Okay, thank you for being on the programme.